Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Wheeler Centre. We would like to begin tonight by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri, and we pay our respects to their elders and families. My name is Tanya Ha. Tonight, I'll be your host as we go on a journey, a flight through time from snowball earth right into the distant future to see how humanity might survive the next mass extinction. To do this, we'll be climbing to a cruising altitude where we can view our species in a geological timescale rather than our usual but somewhat limited human timescale, you know, weeks, months, years. But please note that mobile phones interfere with our navigational equipment, so we politely ask you to turn them off or switch them on to silence. Thank you. <laughs> Now it's my great geeky pleasure to introduce Annalene Newertz. Annalene is the founding editor of the science website io9.com and a journalist with a decade's experience in writing about science, culture and the future. Her work has been published in Wired, Popular Science and the Washington Post, among others. She is the editor of the 2006 anthology, She's Such a Geek, Women Write About Science, Technology and Other Geeky Stuff. If you do another one, can I contribute? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, great. Um, and she was also a Knight Science Journalism Fellow at MIT. Now, Annalie normally lives in San Francisco, where it's currently summer, and all her friends are probably preparing for July the 4th parties, would that be right? Probably. In, yeah? Mm, sounds like fun. But instead, you're here <laughs> in Melbourne in winter just to join us here to talk about her new book. So I think you should all join me in giving her an especially warm welcome to Melbourne. <laughs> Now we're here to talk about Annalene's book, Scatter, Adapt and Remember, how humans will survive a mass extinction. But first, I'm curious to know a little bit about your background. How does, how does someone who has two English teachers as parents and has a PhD in, in English and American studies, how do you end up writing about science? Well, um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I've always been uh, tremendously fascinated by science ever since I was a kid, and I was pretty sure that I would either grow up to be a dinosaur or I would hang out with dinosaurs in space. Um, so either way was, was fine with me. Um, but actually, um, my, my background is uh, when I was um, studying for my PhD, I was writing a lot about representations of science in the media. And so then I kind of grew up to create representations of science in the media. So I just kind of switched sides uh, is what I did, basically. So yeah, that's how I came to this. And I, I read in the book that part of that was um, was disaster movies and monsters and this kind of science fiction. Tell us about your love of these movies. Um, well, I have always been fascinated by disaster stories, and my earliest love is giant monster stories. So that's when you have, you know, a really big animal, uh, you know, maybe it comes from like a rift in time or like, you know, out of the past, there's some kind of nuclear accident. Uh, and then this huge force uh, is either destroying the world or at least destroying a city in the world. And I think it's kind of a way to imagine uh, massive planetary forces that we don't understand. Um, but of course, when you're watching a movie like that or watching, say, a zombie pandemic movie, if any of you are unlucky enough to watch World War Z, which is really one of the worst <laughs> zombie movies that's uh, come around in a long time, the book is, is great. But um, these, are, these are all stories about you know, how, how does the world end? How do we cope with that? Um, and so when I set about to do a book, um, I thought, well, what would happen if I did a nonfiction, hard science version of a disaster movie? Like, what would be the ultimate disaster that I could write about, you know, barring giant monsters, which it turns out um, are actually not real, um, and uh, much to my chagrin uh, when I was five years old. So. Um, Mass extinctions are basically that. Um, they are events where 75% uh, or more of all species on the planet die out. Um, so it's not, a mass extinction isn't when all humans die out or all uh, little penguins die out. It's when you know a huge number of species die out. So you're left with a very small number of species on the planet. 
Um, and there have been five of these already in Earth's history, and they usually take about a million years to happen. So they're very fast in geological time, but they're very slow from the perspective of a human being. So it's very, you, you never can really see one happening in real time, uh, unless you're extremely unlucky. And uh, <laughs> we've never seen a mass extinction happen more quickly than that. One thing I found interesting in the book is how you describe the causes, the influence, the factors that contribute to mass extinction. And I, because I, I tend to think of, you know, the idea of, oh, a huge giant meteor comes and kills the dinosaurs. Um, but I like the way you described the different influences as some are physics, you know, the power of physics, others, it's biology, it's biological contributors. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so each of the mass extinctions that's happened, um, it's been only in about the past um, half billion years or so that we've seen these mass extinctions going on. So remember, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, just to give you a, a quick time scale. And some of the mass extinctions were caused by a meteorite, say, hitting the planet. Uh, that's the most famous mass extinction 65 million years ago, when most of the dinosaurs uh, were killed off. Um, but then there were other mass extinctions caused by supervolcanoes, which are just really long-term massive eruptions. They aren't as cool as you might think. It's not like a giant volcano kind of exploding out of a mountain and like... <laughs> Tsunami um, of fire around the world. There's not a tsunami of fire, which kind of sucks, but um, <laughs> they are, they're basically upwellings of lava. So what you'd see is a big rift would open up, say, in the ocean floor or on a land mass, and lava would just be oozing out over a long period of time, say, a thousand years. And what happens when these events occur is that a lot of toxins and carbon are released into the environment. The same thing happened when that meteorite hit. Uh, the meteorite ultimately caused a climate change. And in fact, most of these mass extinctions are correlated with climate change. Uh, sometimes it's also caused by invasive species. Uh, sometimes um, even before humans, there were life forms that screwed up the environment um, and made it very difficult uh, for creatures that had a, a small habitat um, or uh, needed a very specific kind of food stuff to survive. So what we're looking at when we look at mass extinctions are usually um, either some kind of um, uh, life form or set of life forms that put the uh, ecosystem out of balance uh, because they're in invading every habitat, um, or some kind of natural disaster that's so tremendous that it sets off um, a very long period of climate fluctuation. And so our current um, situation with climate change, you really could look at the Industrial Revolution as being kind of like creating a supervolcano. Um, and it's, it's not clear that the Industrial Revolution will be as damaging as a supervolcano was historically uh, to the environment, but it's, it's a similar kind of process. But I gather that, like past mass extinctions, it's never just or really just one factor. It's often a combination of different weaknesses in ecosystems. You know, I guess a perfect storm of conditions. That's right. And actually, any time um, when a geologist, and generally it's geologists that study mass extinctions because they happened uh, so far back in history, um, and they're looking through layers of rock and fossils to understand um, how these extinctions happened, it's always um, confounding factors. So you never have, it would be so great if you could just say, and then there was a meteorite, it hit the planet, and it blew everything up, and that was the mass extinction. But in fact, um, even when that 65 million year old meteorite um, hit the planet, uh, already um, on the planet there were super volcanoes going off in India, and so those were already polluting the hell out of the planet. So things were already rough, the sea was already um, suffering from acidification, uh, which is what we're seeing again today, um, and then the meteorite hit. So that was when things really got bad. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting is that mass extinctions often sort of feed on themselves. So when you get enough creatures going extinct or enough species going extinct, you get knock-on extinctions. Because if, you're, if the plant that I like to eat, let's say I'm an animal that only eats this one plant, like eucalyptus leaves. Uh, if, a eucalyptus, if the eucalyptus tree I like to eat goes extinct, then I'm going to go extinct too. That's a knock-on extinction. And that's why, for example, scientists worry so much about coral reefs, because that's a whole ecosystem System, the coral reef goes, and a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of creatures are screwed. Um, and so that's that's what that's kind of how mass extinctions happen: is you get this kind of knock-on effect. Some some guys die, and then a whole bunch more die as a result. 
Now, just in case you guys are starting to get depressed, it's, <laughs> yes, we're all going to die, so my doctor tells me, but probably not today. But it's not all doom and gloom, is it, that I gathered them in your research. You started to see a bit of a ray of light, reason for hope. What was that and why? So... I had originally really felt that this book would be quite dark, as you can guess from what I'm, I'm telling you. And I was researching mass extinctions, and it, it's a fairly um, ugly business. Um, but I was research. It's everything sort of changed while I was researching um, a mass extinction that happened at the end of the Permian period, which was about 250 million years ago, and it was a supervolcano mass extinction. And it ultimately there was a, a huge supervolcano in an area which is now Siberia, and ultimately 95 percent of all species on the planet died out as a result of climate change from this this supervolcano. Uh, it was one of the roughest periods in Earth's history. And I'm researching this, and I'm talking to a bunch of scientists, and they're giving me more and more gloomy pictures of, of how this happened. And oh, and then the ocean died, and then some other guys died. But there was one land animal who survived. Uh, it was a four-legged creature called Lystrosaurus. And oh, I hope you make an appearance. <laughs> <laughs> I love Lystrosaurus. So yeah. Lystrosaurus basically looks kind of like a cross between a pig and a lizard. They're about the size of a dog, and they have these big tusks, and they were burrowers. Um, and somehow they managed to make it through this incredibly rough time in Earth's history, basically partly because they were lucky, but partly because they were living underground part of the time. And so it's believed that possibly their lungs were better adapted to deal with um, an environment that had a lot of particulate matter in it, as it might um, after a supervolcano. Um, but also they were great walkers. They just walked all over the continent. This was a time in Earth's history when there was just one giant supercontinent. So these Lystrosaurus guys, these little guys, they had this sort of splay-footed gait, and they kind of <laughs> walked around their little wiggly tail, and they walked all throughout the south of the continent. They speciated, which means they, they evolved into multiple different species. And at a certain point in the early Triassic, which is the period following the Permian, it's estimated that 95% of the animals on land were Lystrosaurus. So Lystrosaurus was very successful, but also it was a very humble creature, and it survived by just doing a few basic things, um, by scattering away from the source of um, danger, which was this uh, supervolcano uh, up in the north, um, and also by adapting to many different environments. And at that point, partly because Lystrosaurus was so darn cute, uh, but also partly because it was such a great survivor and shared certain characteristics with humans, which we could talk about perhaps in a second, um, I really started to get some hope about surviving mass extinctions. I thought, you know, if this pig lizard could survive a mass extinction this profound, um, I think that humans can do it too. And I think we will do it too. And that was kind of the moment at which I, I became very interested in survivor stories. Who were the survivors of these mass extinctions? How did they do it? How did they make it through in order to become basically our ancestors? I mean, Lystrosaurus is a relative of the ancestor of mammals. And so that little lizard pig guy is kind of like our uncle. <laughs> our evolutionary <laughs> uncle. Um, and so that was really what turned me around, was, was, the, was the pig lizard. And there's other examples too, like out of each extinction, there was a certain number of survivors and they were responding, they were, I guess, opportunists in a way. They were opportunists. And of course, when you think about mass extinction, you know, you hear, okay, 75% or more species died out. But that means that, you know, roughly 25% of species didn't die out. Um, even the idea that all the dinosaurs died out, of course, now we know is actually not true because the ancestors of birds were a type of dinosaur winged theropods. And so whenever you look at a bird, you're sort of looking at a survivor of a mass extinction. This is a creature that made it through. Um, crocodiles are another great survivor um, of, a, of a previous mass extinction. And so all of these creatures um, had a few things in common. 
And really the main thing that they had in common and that we share with them is adaptability, an ability to um, exist in a, a, a rapidly changing climate, an ability to move into new environmental niches and find food there. Um, <clears throat> being able to eat garbage is actually a really great survival <laughs> trait, so humans have that down. Um, <laughs> and um, as do sharks, who survived a number of mass extinctions as well. Um, so, so we have some things in common with sharks in that way. Um, <laughs> what evidence is there that, you know, are we at the start of a sixth mass extinction? You know, do, do you think we are, and what does the, the evidence say? It's a good question, um, and it's, of course, heavily debated in the scientific community, but um, there's two really strong pieces of evidence that we may be in the very early stages of a, of a sixth mass extinction. One is that um, extinction levels among land animals are elevated about 30 times above what we would expect to see. So ordinarily, there's something that's called a background extinction rate, which is just the typical rate that animals go extinct, not just animals, but all life forms. And you expect, of course, in the, in the course of evolution over you know, millions of years, animals, plants, uh, bacteria, insects, they're all gonna be going extinct at certain points, that's just normal. Um, and new species will evolve to uh, take over those niches um, in, in each ecosystem. But right now, we're seeing a much, like I said, it's about, depending on the estimate, and again, these are contested estimates, but one estimate does place it at, at 30 times higher, that back, higher than that background extinction rate among land animals. And um, this is based on about 200 years of observation of numbers of species and looking at um, how many species are going extinct and extrapolating from that data. So that's a very worrying sign. Uh, and some scientists actually will say that the death of megafauna, which was, of course, there were a lot of awesome megafauna here in Australia, which are now dead, um, and also in North America, where I'm from, like the mastodons are gone, and all we have left is like a heavy metal band called Mastodon, so, um, which is great, but it's not the same thing. Um, and, uh, and so that may have been kind of the early stage. Because remember, we're looking at a million year period. So if, say, 15,000 years ago, we start to see megafauna going extinct, that would be kind of the very beginning. Then the other piece of evidence of, is, of course, climate change. Because, as I said, nearly every mass extinction we've seen before has been correlated with climate change, which means in the geological record, we can see evidence, strong evidence, that there were fluctuations in climate, either heating greenhouse conditions or profound ice house conditions, where you see um, ice stretching down uh, very far into the lower latitudes. and. Um, and then at the same time, you see this uh, great diminishing of the number of um, uh, life forms on the planet. So when you put those two things together, it's a worrying situation. Um, we have to start thinking about whether we need to be taking steps to uh, make sure that we don't enter into another mass extinction. And the thing about humans is, um, you know, say what you will about how much we suck, and I'm sure you will later, um, but we are actually great problem solvers, and as far as we know, we are the first species to, to ever become aware of the idea of mass extinctions and of the idea of climate change and the carbon cycle, which drives climate change. So the fact that we've actually become aware of these issues, and we may even have the science and the technology to deal with them, uh, is a very good sign. Um, but of course, the question is, how will we do it? Actually, it's interesting because the second part of your book does zoom in on the humans, you know, and it looks at us and not just the environmental, those physical and biological conditions that might contribute to the end of a species, but you also look at the cultural influences, the, the areas in which we've, I guess we've dodged an extinction bullet ourselves and how we've contributed perhaps to endangering our own survival. Tell us a bit about what we've done to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> How we've injured ourselves. So humans have been through a lot of tough times in our history. Uh, 
of course, early in our evolution, um, there was some sort of event. Uh, no one's quite sure what happened, but about um, 80,000 years ago, a lot of Homo sapiens left uh, Africa rather quickly. Uh, and some theories say there was a, a super volcano that changed um, the environment a little bit, but we just don't know. Uh, but what we do know is that there was this sudden uh, fleeing from, uh, from Africa out into Asia and Europe, um, and eventually to the Americas and Australia. And um, so we know that there was some bullet that we dodged at that point, and also during that time, there was a um, diminishing of human genetic diversity. And again, some people want to argue that there was a population crash. There's actually other explanations that I find a little bit more compelling. Uh, but the other kinds of things that we've done to ourselves more recently, uh, perhaps more excitingly, are um, famines and plagues. Uh, humans are great at uh, famine, um, at, at sort of inflicting famine on ourselves. And um, it's recently, I mean, in the past you know, 100 years or so, uh, and really mostly in the past few decades, we've come to realize that famine is not a natural culling of the species. Um, there was a long period when it was believed that humans just naturally starve sometimes, and it just always happens to be that it's disadvantaged people who die. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, it's just natural. Of course, those people are dying out. And um, it's the rat's fault, or it's the <laughs> potato blight's fault. It's it, the potato's yeah. fault. It's not the fault of, you know, um, consistent agricultural policies to um, turn the potato crop into a monoculture and, and force all the people in Ireland to be dependent on it. Um, so uh, famines are a big, um, are kind of a byproduct of city life and um, the growth of agriculture as an enormous business. Um, and so that's a really um, interesting way in which humans have really harmed themselves, especially recently. Um, I shouldn't say interesting, but that's a very profound way that we've harmed ourselves mm. recently. Uh, but also um, pandemics are another um, very, uh, profound result of human civilization. Uh, pandemics, of course, spread much more easily when you have a city um, where people are coming into contact with each other all the time. But of course, as humans have developed international culture, and as we've seen um, over time, we've had uh, trade across the ocean, and of course now we have um, we even have airplanes today, um, <laughs> and which also helps spread uh, pandemics. And um, one of the things that was quite interesting in my research that I discovered was that many pandemics are, in fact, associated with war. And war, of course, the thing about war is that it makes people more vulnerable to becoming sick because often they're living in deprived conditions, uh, but also because soldiers are moving around. People are just moving constantly uh, across continents um, and between continents, and that also can affect um, the spread of pandemics. And so, of course, pandemics are natural, a uh, naturally occurring phenomenon, but for example, the Spanish flu um, in 1918 and 1919 uh, really followed the movements of troops through Europe. And so this human-made invention, war, um, I mean, other creatures have war too, but humans are like really good at it. Um, we're really into it, apparently. Um, and we're very organized about it. Um, that one of the, the ways that um, war damages humans a lot is, is through these pandemics that are associated with it. Um, it's a much bigger killer than, than even war itself. So those are a couple great ways that we've mm. um, undermined ourselves and undermined our ability to survive. Well, another one that I found unexpected was populations living together where there's a, a large gap between rich and poor, that that can... I guess make the whole population vulnerable. Tell us how that happens. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that kind of goes back a little bit to what I was talking about with, with famine and pandemics, um, because when, because oftentimes when you have people living close together, um, you do have um, very stark class divisions where um, people are, who are rich and poor, are living very near each other. Uh, and so if you have a vulnerable population, which oftentimes um, an impoverished population is getting less health care, uh, less food, um, and they're uh, becoming ill at a greater rate, that will spread to the whole population. And so there's a kind of... Um, one of the issues that I deal with in the book and one of the things that I, I strongly believe is that 
one way that we're going to survive as a civilization and as a species, or I should say as civilizations, as a bunch of different civilizations all over the planet, is by uh, thinking of ways that we can remediate this problem of a huge uh, gap between have and have not. Uh, and you know now, of course, that's expressed in differences in wealth. At other periods in history, it's been just differences in access to resources. And uh, that does lead to a healthier community. It leads to a healthier city uh, and a healthier humans. Um, and I think over time, that is something that's going to become deeply important, as much as that we need the science and the engineering to solve a lot of these problems with survival, we also do need to have um, social remediation and thinking mm -hmm. about how we would um, make sure that we don't have those vulnerable populations anymore, mm -hmm. or as little as possible. So I guess like in, in telling those stories of you know, the first part, looking at the mass extinctions, the second, looking at how humanity has dodged the bullet in more recent times, uh, part of that, I guess, is it's nonfiction writing. It's to look at what really happened so we can learn from the past. And that section loans itself to the title, Scatter, Adapt and Remember, you know, three things that we can learn from the past to guide us towards the future. You tell you know, three different examples of scatter, you know, adapt and remember, um, lessons that we can learn from the Exodus story, from grey whales and from um, bacteria, basically, wasn't it? Tell us a little bit about scattering, adapting and remembering. Um, well, those three terms are the sort of three rules of survival. Mm -hmm. And um, all, in my uh, research on these survivor stories, uh, creatures who survived mass extinctions, but also groups of humans who survived uh, despite um, being placed in a vulnerable position uh, or being um, persecuted for you know hundreds of years or whatever, um, what I found was that um, they all, you know, there were there were this there was a sort of shared um, set of techniques that these groups used, and um, the examples that that you're referring to that I gave in the book, um, I sort of picked, I cherry picked a few um, creatures um, and humans who adhered to these to the advice of scattering, adapting, and remembering. Um, and in the section on scattering, I talk about um, a tribe of people known as the Jews today. Um, they've had different names throughout history. Um, and it was actually somewhat of a personal part of the book because I, I grew up, I was uh, raised Jewish, and we would um, have a Passover uh, dinner every year where we would tell the Exodus story. And the Exodus story, uh, for those of you who've read the Old Testament, uh, maybe you've been force-fed the Old Testament, I don't know, uh, depending on how you read it. Um, but it's a story of how um, you know the Jews uh, were a slave um, ethnicity in Egypt. Um, there's actually no historical basis for the story, by the way, which is part of what makes it really interesting. It's a it's a it's a mythological tale, uh, which later became which was later applied to uh, experiences that the Jews had, where they were persecuted and they were um, uh, hounded out of uh, all the great countries of Europe. Um, but uh, at the time that the that the story was first being told, it really was an origin myth. And what happens is the Jews are, um, you know, it sucks in, in Egypt, and they want to leave. And so God kind of helps them out by doing a bunch of nasty stuff to the Egyptians, um, like there's raining blood and there's like plagues and all this kind of stuff. And then finally, um, the Jews get to leave and they they race away. And there's you've probably seen the movie with Charlton Heston. There's like waving of, of wands and things like that. Um, and they they get out into the desert. And um, it actually, the story ends with them kind of in the desert, scattering away from the source of peril. Um, but what people tend to forget is that that is where the story ends. It doesn't end with them kind of getting to Israel and being like, yay, now we're like in Israel, it's really awesome here. Um, it's actually, uh, they, it ends with God saying like, sorry guys, um, your kids are gonna get to Israel, but you're gonna never get to see it. You're just gonna get to wander in the desert. Um, but you know, that's cool because you know, your kids will get to you know, the promised land. Um, and so it's really this lesson in retreating from danger, but also being, being aware that you may never see the end to your story of escape. You may have to let 
future generations um, uh, really continue the story and continue to um, find a place that is uh, home-like. Um, and so that's scatter. And I'll go really quickly through adapt and remember. I have to just say briefly that I, I found that part of the book really moving, I guess because it is a little bit of your personal story there. But, but also uh, we've got this human nature that we really love fighting stuff. We like staying put and conquering. But you talked about the bravery, the, the courage and the honesty of uh, a considered retreat. And I thought that was actually quite a powerful thing for us to think about as humanity, aside from the fact that it is such a familiar story that shed light on something quite different, quite unexpected. So, yeah, it is. And I mean, yeah. I think... I mean, that is one of the things that's really profound about that story is that it's about retreating from war. It's about uh, choosing survival over fighting uh, and realizing mm -hmm. that sometimes sticking around and, say, fighting the Egyptians, that would have been a losing battle. Um, and indeed, um, throughout history, uh, Jews have had to do that over and over again instead of staying and trying to fight the Spanish Inquisition, which, like, that would have been a great idea, right? Um, <laughs> and they had to just flee and scatter again and again um, in these constant diaspora movements. And, of course, many, many other uh, ethnic groups and minority groups have had to do the same thing. And it really is a, a kind of bravery, and it is important mm -hmm. to keep that in mind as a story and to remember it um, as a story as we face the future uh, and we think about how do we want to behave uh, in relation to danger. Um, so adapt and remember in a nutshell? <laughs> adapt and remember in a nutshell, exactly. Because that is part of, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about the the diaspora, which is the, that movement outward and away, uh, it's partly about adapting to new circumstances. It's about finding a new home. Uh, and that's certainly what um, many others, to get back to reality and not sort of origin myths, uh, many species have had to do that um, under dire circumstances, have had to scatter away from their original um, homelands or their original um, environments and ecosystems and adapt to new environments in order to survive. And oftentimes, adapting to a new environment as, say, um, bacteria have done many times, and I, I talk in uh, one chapter about cyanobacteria, which is my favorite bacteria. Um, <laughs> they're the first photosynthesizing organism to ever exist on the planet. So they invented solar power, which makes them super awesome. Uh, we only just invented it, so they've been doing it for like two billion years, so go them. Um, and what, they've, what, what that kind of bacteria has had to do is invent a way to survive in any kind of environment. And that was why um, photosynthesis was a great uh, plan. Um, not that they, I don't think there was like a cyanobacteria meeting where they had a summit <laughs> and they were like, all right, you guys, let's switch away from fossil and we're going to go to solar. Because um, they didn't really have any fossil fuel at that time. Um, and so <laughs> it wasn't even an option. Um, and, uh, but, what, but what they had to do was come up with a way of producing energy that would allow them to live at the equator, that would allow them to live um, way at the poles, uh, anywhere on the planet where they could, where there was water and sunlight, um, they, they could survive. Um, and that's, they're, of course, the ultimate survivors. Cyanobacteria have survived every mass extinction. They're still around. If you ever see pond scum, you're looking at the ultimate survivor. And I really do think that we have a lot to learn from them, uh, partly because, you know, solar power is a great idea. It is a great survival strategy. Um, but it's also about um, finding home wherever you can get it um, and, and learning to adapt to it. And, um, you know, part of, and that's part of where memory comes from, too. Uh, the idea of remembering is not just remembering your own past, but also using science to remember the whole history of Earth. Um, or to remember the history of our species and the many um, trials and tribulations we've gone through and the ways <clears throat> that other animals have, have figured out how to deal with these uh, problems, whether they're climate change problems or dealing with invasive species. And um, the funny thing about adapt adaptation or adapting is <clears throat> that it all often involves evolving. And maybe we can talk about that a bit more later. Um, but when we think about the future of humanity and we think about how humans will adapt to new environments, we need to be thinking also in the long term about how will humans evolve? Because um, 
I know we all seem really awesome right now because we've got say, like you mean we're not perfect. I know we're we not are. perfect. It's weird. We got two legs. We got two arms. We got the fingers thing. The opposable thumbs. That was a great idea. Um, you know, we have teeth and everything. Um, but we're not the final product. We're just starting. Um, we evolved about two hundred thousand years ago. And um, the typical mammal, life, the typical lifespan of a mammalian species, we're mammals, um, is about a million years. So we're really early in our species lifespan, which means by the end of that million years, we might be really different. There might be more than one species that has evolved out of Homo sapiens. And um, we may have evolved to live in very different environments, maybe not even on Earth. And that's going to be part of our journey forward, is adapting means changing. And so we may lose, we may lose the teeth, or we may lose the <laughs> feet. I don't know. Um, but we may also gain uh, some really great survival skills along the way. Mm, that could be interesting. Yeah. But looking in the, well, I guess in geological terms, the immediate future of the yes. next you know, hundreds, thousands of years, what have we learned that we're starting to apply to, I guess, making our cities death proof to making them suitable for future disasters or climate change you know what's happening now so i think that um luckily uh humans have been learning uh something from uh the history of survival i mentioned earlier um our friend cyanobacteria the great survivors um the scum of the earth um, they actually are scum of the earth. That's kind of awesome. And, um, Good scum, though. Yeah, they're our friend scum. And um, they and and so um, you know, photosynthesis being the first solar power, I think, has given humans a lot of ideas about how we should move forward to um, you know produce alternative fuels that will not uh, feed into uh, climate change and not cause uh, the climate to change rapidly, which of course leads to extinctions. And the other thing um, that I'm really interested in is a movement that's just starting now that's a kind of combination of city planning and synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is a very new field of biology which looks at how do we build life forms. Mostly, they're looking at bacteria. We're not talking about like building a better human um, or anything like that. And in fact, I tried to get synthetic biologists to talk to me about that, and they were all like, "No, <laughs> we only look at bacteria." Um, so, but what what that means is that the the synthetic biologists are looking at ways that you can modify bacteria to be used as new kinds of building materials. And working with architects and city planners to think about how you might create what's called a living city, a city that behaves kind of like an organism that would be as much part of its ecosystem as trees and lakes uh, and grasses and animals are today. Uh, and one good example of how this might work is um, one possible application of synthetic biology would be in self-healing materials. And this is something that's already in use now. Basically, these are materials um, like, uh, for example, sealants for ships, um, which can actually heal themselves. So if you get uh, a bit of damage to your ship hull, um, the material will actually close up and um, close that damage. Um, and so you get a smooth hull again. And there is a group of um, students who invented uh, self-healing concrete a couple of years ago. And the idea would be, and it's, it's made partially with bacteria. And uh, by the way, when, when synthetic biologists make a new life form like, say, uh, self-healing concrete, it's not really like um, regular bacteria. You can't like <laughs> eat it and suddenly grow um, uh, concrete in your stomach. So um, it, it's not like going to be a, a great prank in the future where you like, you know, give your teacher some bacteria and they, they grow like a wall in their stomach. Um, so they, they're programmed to die off. Um, so what you would have is you might have a wall that was built using, uh, or a bridge that was built using self-healing concrete. And if there's some sort of damage uh, structurally, uh, cracks might form, and the concrete would actually seal it up and um, release um, calcium and uh, 
and epoxies and really uh, create actually a stronger uh, bond between the two sides um, around the crack than even existed before. And they dem the students demonstrated this, and it actually does work. And um, so you could imagine a city in the future, say in 100 years, that was built with a lot of different materials like this, self-healing materials that behaved kind of like an organism. And it would be very sustainable because you wouldn't need to just rip things down um, when they started to fall apart. They could actually heal themselves, uh, but also safer. I mean, one of the things about a living city is you want it to be robust against disasters. Um, I live in San Francisco, so we think constantly about earthquakes. And this would be a great um, way of having a city that was robust against earthquakes because damage could be uh, repaired. Uh, it could be that it would prevent more deaths because you would have have uh, materials in the city that uh, were even more um, flexible than what we have now. And um, you would also be doing things like building with, uh, say, algae. Like modified algae might serve as your lighting system. Al <laughs> actually, you know, algae can glow. It's a qu quite nice kind of a greenish blue glow. It might sound gross to you, but it may be in the future people would be more used to it. Um, it could be a water filtration system. It could be an air filtration system. So I talked to one architect who said he believes that in the future, cities would look like ruins in the jungle because you'd have these buildings that were kind of pockmarked and, and scarred, and they'd be covered in vines and, um, and, and mold. But that would be the structure of the city because it would be part of the living uh, ecosystem all around it, and it wouldn't be a contradiction with that ecosystem. It would actually be functioning as, it would have a kind of metabolism. So that's one of the ways that I think right now scientists and city planners are learning from nature and looking to the future. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a very hopeful sign because if we can start thinking of our living spaces as being part of the environment and having their own metabolism, I think that's a very um, good way of trying to imagine a much more sustainable way of living without sacrificing all the wonderful awesomeness of civilization, right? So say it's like a, looks like a, a jungle ruin on the outside, but in, on the inside there's like high-speed internet. Um, so it's still <laughs> really awesome on the inside. Because um, I, I mean, that we don't have to lose all of these amenities of civilization. I don't mean to suggest that the internet is, is civilization. Um, but uh, we don't have to lose that in order to have um, a sustainable um, and, a, and a kind of um, yeah, yeah, a sustainable future. So our future might look a bit more like Hobbiton rather than Blade Runner, I like to think. <laughs> you know, I in, think so. <laughs> I think in um, the final part of the book, this is where it gets really interesting, you know, sort of what I call genre bending because it moves from, I guess, classic science writing into um, something a bit more speculative. So I, I think of this book as kind of a, a hybrid of... Um, of science writing and science fiction as well, but it's evidence-based science fiction. So tell us about the last part of the book where you look into ultimately what could, you know, emphasis on could the future of humanity look like? So I already talked about living cities, which is futuristic enough. Uh, but when you start thinking about humans surviving in the long term, which, as I said, I think there's ample evidence that we will be surviving, the question is, what should, what should we be striving for? What should be our long-term projects as a species? And I think it's clear from our history that we're amazingly good at exploring. We're fantastic explorers. We're at our best when we're charting um, you know, new terror, going out into new continents, you know, leaving Africa and checking out Asia and Europe and, and learning to live in new places and adapt to new places. And I think we're going to continue that exploration by ultimately living off the planet, um, maybe living on other planets, other moons, or maybe building um, artificial environments in space. And again, I, I should emphasize, this is not something I think is going to happen in the next 50 years. If it does, yay, but I don't <laughs> think so. I have a lot of friends who are totally convinced we're going to upload our brains in the next 50 years and we're all going to be living on Saturn. Um, and I will totally go if that happens, but I think this is a very long-term picture. I'm talking thousands of years. And I know that may be disappointing for everybody who wants to go with Elon Musk to Mars. Um, but 
the, a nice analog um, in human history for how we might approach uh, space travel is to think about how humans approached intercontinental travel. So originally, uh, humans were pretty much on the African and Eurasian land masses. And eventually, though, we got to Australia about 50,000 years ago, which was a great um, you know, breakthrough technologically. And humans did it in basically reed boats. And between that time, 50,000 years ago, when we arrived in reed boats here in Australia and um, hung out with the megafauna, um, it took a really long time before we had what you would consider to be a truly global civilization. Even, you know, say, now we think maybe humans arrived in the Americas maybe 14,000 years ago. Um, so it really was a long period, even after that, that we started to have ships crossing the water all the time, having international uh, trade, having, or I should say, intercontinental trade. So when you think about, okay, first ships crossing the ocean 50,000 years ago, uh, but truly intercontinental civilization starts around 500 years ago. That's a big lag. I think right now, in terms of space travel, we're pretty much at that 50,000 years ago mark. We're just taking some rockets and sending them to a few other places in terms of what we've done with humans. We've taken humans to the moon. Um, we're sending some robots out, and we've, we've explored the solar system that way, but we're still in a very early stage of this technology. And I don't think it's going to, I really don't think it's going to take us 50,000 years before we're living on other planets. I hope not. That would really kind of suck. But I do think that um, it'll take a very long time before between where we are now with exploring space and a period when we might actually have um, interplanetary travel or um, a solar system based civilization or set of civilizations. So I think between now and that awesome um, solar system based set of human civilizations, a lot of things are going to have to change. One, we're going to have to get away from this whole rocket fuel idea, like we're going to use rockets to escape. Uh, the gravity well. It's terrible. Rocket fuel is not sustainable. It's very polluting. Um, it's, a, it's a really crappy way to get off the planet. So I think we're going to have to invent some kind of technology uh, to get humans out of the gravity well very easily um, and regularly. So something like a space elevator, which I talk about in the book. Um, and then I think as we think about humans spreading to these new environments, we have to think about, again, adapting and evolving. And it's possible that we will intervene in our own evolution and we will actually uh, change our germline and change ourselves genetically to uh, live on other worlds. One thing we know for sure is that humans, as we are now in these kind of flesh bags, um, we're not good at living in space because there's a lot of radiation and we're not radiation proof. So one simple modification we might make early on in, this, um, in becoming a space faring civilization would be uh, modifying our DNA to repair itself uh, after radiation damage. And there's actually already scientists now who are working on that question and trying to figure out um, whether that would be possible, whether there's some people who are more resistant to radiation damage or more able to repair their DNA after radiation damage. Um, and this is the same problem with living on other planets, too. Um, I've, so I've got one more little more political question before I throw it open to you guys, who I'm sure will have your own questions to ask yeah. Annalene. Um, you might have heard on the radio when you've been in taxis or travelling around that we're in an election year here in Australia. And I think like, like the United States, we've had a lot, of, um, a lot of problems with public understanding of science, the acceptance of climate change, and yet we're going into an election in which the big issues will be things like our plans for food security, how do we adapt to climate change, what's the best model for a national broadband network, what healthcare do we have for an ageing population? And these, these are all issues in which science, engineering and technology is, is crucial. But at the same time, you know, one of our local um, science journalism legends in Australia, our, our national living treasure, Robin Williams, described science journalists as an endangered species. Is that something that you're experiencing? And, and what 
do you, given that your book talks about the need for a humanity to work together, which necessarily means the involvement of government and getting the message out to people who vote, what's the role of scientists, science journalists, people with an interest in science, and even science fiction writers in helping set us on that path or these paths that we might need to take to help our species to survive? Well, I think there has to be a role uh, for scientists and engineers and the people who tell their stories uh, in politics and in government. Um, and when I say the people who tell their stories, I really mean both science journalists and science fiction writers who do hard science fiction, who are really trying to tell stories about the future of where science and, and engineering might take us. Um, we're also in the United States dealing with a really big problem with um, science in government. Our government is cutting funding to a number of science programs, and so uh, many of the labs that I visited while um, working on my book were in danger of losing all their funding and, and not being able to continue this work on things like creating sustainable cities. So it was very terrifying to see that possibility that government might let down uh, the scientific community and might just sort of cut science out of its agenda. So I think it's really important right now, especially as we're facing this really slow motion disaster of climate change and of um, needing to develop new kinds of energy, that we have a strong voice for science and engineering in government. And I wish I had a magical way of, of explaining how that would happen. I think what needs to happen is that more stories need to be told about the role that science can play in building a better future for humans. And I think part of the problem is that um, we're not hearing enough of those stories or that we're hearing stories that are nonsensical or pseudoscientific. And you know that's partly the fault of science fiction a little bit. I mean, I'm excited about the movie Pacific Rim, which is gonna be about you know, giant monsters fighting giant robots. Mm -hmm. Not a terribly um, informative uh, piece of um, you know, science uh, fiction. It's not gonna teach you about how science might uh, help humanity. Um, so I think it's, it's incumbent on us as science journalists to do that work, but I also think that voters do need to be pushing government to be funding education and to be funding uh, science research, basic science research. And I think, especially in the states, um, it's very, there's a strong emphasis on how business is supposed to kind of step in and, and pay for all of our magical science of the future, um, which, and I use the word magical like quite deliberately because I think that's ridiculous. Uh, business can't be expected to bear that burden uh, for, sci for scientific research that may never come to fruition, that may never have any kind of um, market value. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, I mean, government has to play a big role in it. And I mean, it remains to be seen um, whether that's going to happen. But I think that as, um, as the situation gets worse in terms of how the climate is changing and how that's translating into things like famines, uh, because of course, as the climate changes, that's what it's gonna be. It's gonna be drought and famine, not just for us, but for lots of other species. I think that it may become alarming enough that people will start to vote that way. But like I said, I think it has to be a combination of mm. good storytelling, teaching people about how science can save the future, um, <laughs> save the world, um, but also government responding to it. And if they don't respond to it, then we need to be organizing. Hold them to account. Yeah, hold them mm. to account kick their asses, you know? I mean, not, not in a mean way, in a, in a, in a democratic way, in a voting way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, that would be my goal. Mm. It's over to you guys now. Does anyone have a burning question or even like a lightly simmering one? Put your hand up. <laughs> lightly simmering. <laughs> You mentioned really quickly about the storytelling aspect. Do you have a hard science fiction writer that stands out as someone that you think is telling a really good story about the future of, of where we could go post-Earth? There are a lot. Um, I actually have a whole chapter in the book on Octavia Butler, uh, who's an American science fiction writer um, who sadly died uh, about 10 years ago now. Um, and she writes very uh, compellingly about 
human evolution. Um, I'm kind of boiling down her books to something really basic, but one of the really great messages, I think, in her work is that um, in order for humans to survive, we have to accept that we will have to change radically. And I think that's something that we, we shy away from. You know, we think the future will be like Star Trek, where we all are still in the same meat sacks, but we're like zooming around in space. I don't think that's likely to be the case. I think that that uh, the humans who live in space might be like cyborg squid creatures. <laughs> and we need to um, you know, really think about that, about how we are part of a, a very rapidly changing species. Um, and then, of course, there's people like, um, there's a great book that came out recently by Kim Stanley Robinson called 2312, um, which I highly recommend because um, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting look at how we might do geoengineering, which is um, actually engineering the, the geology, not just of Earth, but other planets, um, in order to create um, many different civilizations in the solar system. And the reason why um, it's, a, it's also very interesting politically is that uh, Robinson is aware of the politics involved in such an endeavor. He's not naively saying like, do do do, we're going to go out and we're going to like terraform all the planets and it's going to be awesome. Um, there's all kinds of political infighting. There's different um, national interests and economic interests at stake. And so it's a really nice thought experiment, not just in there's a lot of sexy terraforming, but then there's also this really rich uh, political backstory. But I could like list a billion others, so you can ask me afterward, and I'll, I'll give you a reading list. <laughs> so another question? Um, just wanted to ask about yourself and IO9, uh, whether you would, uh, wouldn't mind just uh, sharing with us how you got started with IO9 and uh, what you see as the direction uh, of it. Um, so io9 is a science and science fiction website uh, that I edit, and, um, and there's about eight of us who work there now. And um, we started in 2008, um, back in the Permian period, um, <laughs> and uh, right around the supervolcano time. And um, our goal has always been to mix science and science fiction coverage together, not in the same story necessarily, so it's not, um, you know, we actually do have uh, very rigorous scientific reporting, uh, as well as uh, reporting on science fiction as, as culture and entertainment, and, and futurism. And our goal is, um, you know, other than world domination, um, <laughs> is basically to get people really excited about the future and really thinking about the role that science and engineering can play in the future and how um, new developments in science uh, really are connected to developments in culture. And um, we don't, I mean, we do really have like a strong um, agenda of um, getting people to think about our long-term survival and getting people excited about science. And um, I'm, I'm pretty open about that. I really want people to come to io9, learn a little bit about science there, and then go out and read the scientific papers, uh, go out and study more science on other sites and in other publications, and um, hopefully turn you into a big, giant nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got time for another two questions, I reckon. And Lee, where do you think the, the near term, um, if, if humans are going to evolve, where do you see the nearest term evolution being? Do, do you see some kind of cyborg? Is, that, is it going to be some kind of human um, technology interface? Is that how we're going to evolve? Is that be the most rapid adaptation we're going to see? Or is it, is it going to be some kind of genetic engineering? That's a really good question. Um, I wish I knew the answer. I suspect it'll be a little bit of both. Um, probably we're going to see technological enhancements um, more quickly than we see um, actual biological meddling, like genetic meddling. Uh, we already have people who have things like cochlear implants, which are basically brain implants, um, and people who do have um, deep brain stimulation devices, and um, you know, people who have other kinds of um, you know, bionic limbs that, that actually respond to, to neural signaling. So they're often in the media called mind-controlled um, prosthetics, uh, which they kind of are. I mean, you think, that you, you think, I want my arm to move, and it will move. Um, so I think that those kinds of modifications, I don't know if they would be properly called evolution, um, but we certainly will be seeing those more quickly. People are really... Um, 
for lack of a better term, freaked out by <laughs> biological modification. And so I think there's going to have to be a cultural shift before we see people being willing to uh, change the biology of their children um, you know, radically. And um, I actually had a conversation with, with Kim Stanley Robinson about that because so much science fiction just assumes that. Like, oh, well, we all started modifying our bodies genetically and it was really neat and that's just how it is. And I, I, I asked um, Robinson, like, well, what do you think we'd need, how would we have to change to have everyone accept that? And he said he thought it would be longevity enhancements. So once we had a way of genetically altering humans to live, like, say, an extra 100 years, that that would really open the door to people being willing to change other things about themselves genetically. So that's one possibility. I don't know if that's true, but um, it does seem like an interesting way of looking at it. We'll take one last question. Um, hi, I suppose on um, sort of leading on from that, um, I work in like, climate change adaptation and stuff like that. How do you deal with the dinosaurs who don't want to change? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, they all evolve into birds eventually. Um, so um, it's a good question. I mean, it's a very, um, I think that as humans, we're very anxious to have change happen, especially like those of us who are involved in, uh, you know, trying to persuade people that uh, climate change is a, a disaster that's going to be happening um, over the coming centuries. Um, it's hard when people just refuse to believe, you know, really fundamental stuff, like even believe that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Like that's a big sticking point for some people, especially in America. Um, and um, I mean, really, like you, you have no idea. And um, and uh, it's it's so it's it is very difficult. And I think part of it is just accepting that you know some people really are never going to be persuaded. Uh, and that's how humans have often been. You know, there's often been these really um, hard to resolve conflicts, and yet the species has um, continued on, and we have to basically keep uh, pushing for that change and keep uh, agitating and um, you know working as much as we can, whether in the lab or whether in the streets to um, make those changes happen. But I think, you know, it gives me hope that um, we didn't even know that the carbon cycle existed 50 years ago. Um, I mean, think about that. Like, 50 years ago, that's in my parents' lifetime, uh, we didn't even know that there was a carbon cycle or that we could affect climate change. And now, climate change is on the top of our international political agenda. And it's true, it could be higher up on the list, you know, it could be like number one thing on the political agenda for all the nations, and that would be great. But the fact is that it's gone from something that we didn't even understand 50 years ago to something that is absolutely crucially important in election years and in um, international relations. And that's really fast. I mean, remember, you know, like I said, I mean, humans have been around for like 200,000 years, and in 50 years, that's been a huge transformation. And so those poor dinosaurs, you know, they are going to die out, and they're, the, the world after they die out will be um, a world where everyone is, is struggling with this, um, with this disaster that we're facing and trying to remediate, uh, to remediate the, the problems that we've already created. So, um, you know, take hope from the fact that that 50 years has been a pretty amazing 50 years. And in another 50 years, things might just be so different um, that it would be almost impossible for us to recognize. I hope that it will be better. I hope we'll be living in, in living cities um, and sustainable um, homes and we won't be like in caves eating worms. Um, you know, so hopefully I won't be seeing you in the caves. Yeah. So talking terms like 50 years, that makes me feel like we're coming into land now back in the human time, time scale. So before we finish up, just very quickly, for anyone in the audience, you know, including myself as well, for those who are a little bit nervous about our uncertain future, what things can we do today to, to start preparing or to make ourselves better able to survive into the future? What are the little day-to-day -day tips? 
Um, you know, I think that um, there's the the really basic sort of um, in the environmental equivalent of eat a balanced breakfast and exercise a lot, which is, you know, obviously focus on um, trying to consume less energy, um, use alternative sources of energy, um, you know, engage as much as possible in um, recycling. And, and I don't just mean recycling, like, you know, put it in the right canister, but like using recycled water and encouraging uh, companies that you work with to use recycled water, encouraging, um, you know, uh, your government to have uh, better programs for, um, you know, uh, researching alternative energies, for example. And so I think those are all, again, I mean, it's, it's everything the environmentalists told, environmentalists told you is right, um, is kind of what I'm saying. It's, you know, that, that is the kind of stuff that we- Did you hear that? <laughs> That's kind of shame, shameless self-promotion. That happens to be the thing that I write books on, folks. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, read Tanya's books um, and, uh, and, and, and take that advice. And I think that that is all good near-term stuff. And it does feed into a much bigger, longer-term human project, which is to transform ourselves into a species that is is uh, living more sustainably and that's living more consciously as part of the ecosystem. We figured out how to dominate ecosystems uh, and now we need to figure out how to sustain those ecosystems because if we don't sustain them, we're gonna starve. Um, there's a, a lot of self-interest here and humans <laughs> love that, right? We love self-interest. Um, we're super great at that. So I think that um, you know that's part of what we need to be doing is thinking about, yeah, there's these near-term solutions, but in the long term, we need to be investing in scientific research and investing in uh, better city planning so that we can actually create uh, an infrastructure here on the planet that be People, that people can be living in in a thousand years or in 6,000 years or a million years and really um, owning that and realizing that what we do now um, really can have that kind of a long-term impact. When you think about how long some cities on the planet have existed uh, for thousands of years, um, humans really can make structures that last and can make communities and cultures that last for thousands of years. And we just need to, to be more conscious about doing it on into the future. And I, I think we're, we're gonna make it. Um, it's so going to be then, rough, but we're going we're gonna to get through. A bit, bit of turbulence, perhaps. Yeah. So mm. there is hope for the future. So I think we can now safely unfasten our seatbelts and give a huge round of applause to Annalene Newitz. Thank you for coming here.